Hello and welcome to today's, to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. My name is Chris Muncier. I'm a professor in civil and environmental engineering at Portland State University. And together with Professor Jenny Liu in Urban Studies and Planning, we co-host uh, this uh, seminar. I'll be moderating today's session. The Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition at PSU since, since 2000. These seminars are usually held live on the PSU campus. Um, but due to the COVID pandemic, uh, we are offering them online. The Portland State University campus is located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, bands of the Chamuk, and the Tualatin, Kalaiopuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge that we are here because of their sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place remember their communities, honor their legacies and descendants. Today, we are very pleased to have Josh Roll and Nathan McNeil presenting on pedestrian safety, pedestrian safety and social equity in Oregon. Josh Roll is the active and sustainable transportation research coordinator with Oregon DOT's research unit. He conducts and coordinates research on a variety of topics, including bicycle and pedestrian travel, traffic safety, transportation decarbonization, among others. Josh enjoys using data and models to tell evidence-based stories and holds out hope that with better information, transportation system managers <clears throat> can improve the performance of the system by reducing traffic, injury, traffic injuries, reducing less carbon emissions, and providing equitable access for everyone. Nathan McNeil is a research associate in Portland State University Center for Urban Studies. He conducts research on impacts of travel, transportation, and transit equity on new bicycle infrastructure and programs on travel behavior and attitudes towards cycling, on shared use mobility programs, including car share and bike share, and on the connection between the land use and transportation. He was the co-principal investigator on a recent national study of bike share equity and, a, and of protected bike lane implementations. Nathan received a Master's of Urban Regional Planning from Portland State University, studied history at Columbia University as an undergraduate. Prior to PSU, Nathan worked for the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York City as a performance auditor, where he evaluated capital programs and contractors. Uh, before jumping into the seminar, uh, here are the upcoming uh, seminars for the rest of the quarter. Uh, so I'll take, just take a look at those and, and note them and book them on your calendar. Just a quick overview of today's webinar on the Zoom, Zoom webinar. Well, the speakers will talk for uh, 35 to 45 minutes and will follow by a Q&A. Please uh, type your uh, questions in the Q&A box on the Zoom webinar control feature. Uh, at the end of the seminar, uh, Professor Lou and I will ask the questions um, in a moderated format. We do ha have closed captioning enabled, but you need to turn on the CC feature in your uh, control panel. We'll be recording today's webinar and the slides and the presentation will be available afterwards. And if you need PDH hours, um, this el webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education. So with that, I will stop the share and turn it over to our presenters. Great, thank you, Professor Monser. Um, can I get a nod from you, sir, that you can see the presentation screen? Yeah, great. Um, well, thank you for that introduction and, and thanks for having uh, myself and Nathan uh, come and present and share some of the work that we've been doing over the last year. I'm a Portland State uh, alum from the Urban Studies Program, so it's exciting to be here and uh, presenting at this class that I that I took you know, a decade ago. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we're going to go through um, some of the research project objectives. Um, we're going to kind of take a little diversion and talk about some high level uh, uh, inputs to crash safety to kind of get people's minds thinking about, um, you know, all the things that kind of go into crash safety before we get into some of the research project findings. And then I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, who's going to focus on um, how our research work fits into the existing body of, of evidence. 
Um, and then we'll, we'll end with some recommendations um, that are uh, phase one, at least of this, of the work that we're doing has, has concluded on. So um, this project at ODOT Research started in um, 2018 um, when we had a visiting scholar from Rutgers come and talk to Oregon Department of Transportation's governing board, the, the Oregon Transportation Commission. Um, the, the OTC and um, a similar governing body from the Oregon Health Authority gathered to listen to um, this visiting scholar's uh, name was Charles Brown from Rutgers. Uh, talk about the intersection of health and transportation and also the intersection between health, transportation and, and social equity and presented some results about um, how in New Jersey, where he was doing research, there's communities of how in places with higher uh, levels of uh, higher proportions of, of communities of concern, low income people and people of color, um, how injury disparities were higher in those areas or injury rates were higher in those, in, in those areas. So this sort of started the process uh, with our ODOT uh, research office of getting a, a, a project going. Um, so once a project was selected, um, that was uh, we, we set up some objectives for that work um, that I've summarized here. The big one was, you know, how do we measure uh, injury disparity, uh, pedestrian injury disparity by race or income or other social equity measures? Um, and once we establish a way to measure that, you know, can we detect whether or not these disparities are changing over time. Um, and then we had a near-term uh, objective of, of getting something produced to help inform um, our ongoing uh, transportation safety action plan that the agency was putting together. And for the first time, um, putting something about social equity into um, that, uh, that safety plan. There's other things going on at ODOT that this was helping to inform as well, this research, um, including some of the elements in the strategic action plan um, our active transportation unit um, ha has a has a project selection um, uh, multi criteria selection plat uh, 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 platform called the ATNI. This work has helped to inform some of that um, project selection process, and um, some of the work has uh, helped to inform what is sort of an ongoing effort to reevaluate some of our safety programs and ensure that we are accounting for social equity when, when we can. So that's some of the outcomes. But um, the main thing we hear was just, um, you know, finding ways and methods to measure social equity um, and the relationship with pedestrian injury, um, detecting whether or not these things have changed over time. Um, and so before we get into some of those results, I just like to help, uh, I think uh, I like to introduce this uh, system inputs for crash injury framework um, to get folks thinking about all the things that sort of play into uh, crash injury. Um, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of complexity in, in explaining, you know, why there are crash injuries um, and traffic crashes, but the three main buckets that I consider when I'm thinking about this big picture are the three, um, three buckets we have here uh, shown in, in, in these three circles. Travel activity, human behavior, vehicle design, and, and road design and operation. And there's a lot of complexity in each of these three buckets. They're all interacting. Um, but I think it's helpful to sort of contextualize, like, you know, where do we intervene in the system? What are the causes um, for these outcomes? And, and so, you know, travel activity, human behavior, that's just sort of like, how do we travel? What mode do we take? What time of day? Um, you know, what kind of risky behaviors do we, do we introduce into our travel behavior, whether it's, you know, speeding or drinking too many beers and, and traveling, um, you know, uh, things within our cognitive ability, like teenagers with, you know, undeveloped brains out there driving, you know, those sorts of things all playing into travel activity. Um, vehicle design, another obvious uh, element in, in, in the sort of big systems perspective here on crash injury, you know, we have been, we benefit now from a, from vehicles that have a huge number of safety features that are standard seat belts, collapsible steering columns, padded dashboards, crumple zones, all those things have really significantly reduced uh, the, the injury rates for vehicle occupants. Um, it's one of the big uh, public health success stories of the 20th century. Um, but we're also starting to see how weight and horsepower and design features are starting to be uh, potential problems for people outside the vehicle. So all the benefits of, of vehicle safety haven't necessarily accrued to those outside the vehicle. And then uh, road design and operation. Um, you know, we know that uh, design matters and we know that it can influence human behavior um, and mitigate some of those things. We know this because um, we do really rigorous studies and look at, um, you know, uh, the, the geometric and operational characteristics of a, of a site before 
Um, we install a treatment. You know, I have a, I have a picture here of a place on Powell at, at around 20th um, where we, you know, intervene in the system and put in medians and put in some other treatments. Um, and, and we know that these things can work because we, we, we produce these really rigorous studies um, using some before and after type methodology. And we've compiled all those into the crash modification factor database that Federal Highways manages. So we know that road design can play a big role in, um, in, in changing the, the crash injury uh, frequency. <clears throat> So these things in mind, you know, these, these human behavior and travel activity and vehicle design and roadway design and operation, those are the things I want people to be thinking about as we get into the research results that, that we've completed. So for context, um, one of the things for folks to know is that in Oregon, and, and this is national for the most part too, uh, pedestrian injuries have been increasing um, and they've been increasing faster than uh, motor vehicle fatal and severe injuries. We, we focus on fatal and severe injuries because that's um, the types of injuries that ODOT has, has uh, is caring, you know, sort of cares about in some of our policy and, and planning documents. Um, and so what we can see here in this chart is, you know, compared to the first five year period um, in, in the early 2000s, um, uh, pedestrian injuries are, are rising pretty quickly. Um, you know, up up thirty percent from that early period compared to motor vehicle uh, fatal and severe injuries, which are relatively flat. One of the things, uh, in terms of context, is important too is to think about the modal inequity um, for uh, pedestrian travelers of the network. So we have a chart here that's just comparing the fatal and severe injuries per hundred million miles of travel by mode. Um, the, these data are a little old. Um, they take the, the exposure measures, the number of miles of travel are taken from our travel survey, which we only do about every 10 years. Um, and so it'd be interesting to see what this looks like now with the new newer survey data. But what we show is that pedestrian injury rates uh, on a per mile basis are 30 times higher than uh, motor vehicle rates. Um, there's some limitations here because our travel survey doesn't necessarily account for all pedestrian injury, or excuse me, all pedestrian travel, but um, other research has shown uh, similar findings and disparity uh, across modes, um, places in Wisconsin, uh, studies in places like Wisconsin, British Columbia um, have shown that there's a, a higher rate of injury per mile of travel for pedestrians uh, compared to other modes. Um, and of course, motorcycles, very dangerous, don't drive a motorcycle would be the punchline there. So as we think about how then um, with these modal disparities uh, known um, and, and thinking about what um, how, how we would measure in, uh, pedestrian injury disparity uh, by some race or income factor in, in Oregon. And, um, you know, this isn't super straightforward and uh, because the ODOT crash data doesn't necessarily track uh, income or race, um, but the, the feds, um, the, the, uh, the National uh, Highway Safety uh, Transportation Administration, NHTSA, they do manage uh, a database of, of fatal injury data where they do track the race of the participant, um, which comes from death certificate data. And what we find when we take the number of injuries um, and divide it by the population um, and we separate those, those rates out by uh, race category, uh, which we're presenting here in this chart, we find that uh, for BIPOC populations, pedestrian injury rate is much higher than the state average. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we went uh, about directly measuring injury disparities, uh, pedestrian injury uh, disparities by race. Another way um, that we went about measuring injury disparities is looking at the uh, number of injuries within census tracts, another number of pedestrian injuries by census tracts. And what we did was we categorized our census tracts by the concentration of, of low-income people and BIPOC populations within each of those census tracts. And so what you see here in the blue bar, uh, that's places, that's census tracts that have higher than the state average concentration of low-income populations and BIPOC people. Um, and so this blue bar represents about eight, 195 census tracts. That's about a million uh, Oregonians. 20, that's around 25% of the population, but it's where 40% of the fatal and severe pedestrian injury um, uh, occur. Compare that to this, uh, the lowest category. So this represents about you know, over a million people, 1.2 million people, 240 tracks. It's where 28% of the population lives, but it's only where it's, but it's where 16% of the fatal and severe injuries occur. So you can see here too, I have in the bullets, um, the percentage, the average percentage of the population in these two categories that live in poverty and that are BIPOC. And so um, to, 
show how we did this in a little more detail. Um, you know, again, we took our census tracts, we categorized them based on the percentage of the population compared to the state average that are people living in poverty, people uh, of color. And this is what this looks like for Salem. Um, and so you can see spatially what this looks like. And then we just take those uh, counts of pedestrian injuries and divide by the population for all the census tracts within each of those categories. And again, what we find is that the uh, injury rates in those census, those census tracts classified as moderate and high are higher than the state average, indicating a disparity or inequity. Two of the punchlines that we've featured in our work uh, regarding why these injuries, injury disparities or inequities occur within race and within race and income are that people living in these neighborhoods and census tracts walk more and take transit more. Um, that's pathway number one. <clears throat> They're exposed more and um, therefore, you know, just you know, thinking about that framework we introduced earlier, you know, just are more out there and more likely to be involved in a collision because they're exposed more because they're walking, taking transit more. And we'll talk about why we know that. Uh, and the second pathway is that they're doing that walking and transit activity in environments that aren't necessarily set up for that type of activity. And so um, getting into more detail here, these two pathways, um, the first being more walking and transit is, you know, we can measure this um, looking at our census data, look um, where, um, we can measure things like the percentage of the households without a vehicle, um, the percentage of the workers within those communities that take walk or bike or transit to get to work to access jobs, um, and other proxies for this type of activity, things like transit stop density. So what I show here in these charts are uh, those census tracts classified as high in the blue bin and the percentage of the vehicles in that, in that left-hand chart. The percentage of the households who don't have a vehicle, 12% of households within high concentration tracks don't have how uh, don't have a vehicle compared to just seven about seven percent for the Oregon average so a higher higher rate of zero vehicle ownership um, the percentage of workers who commute to work um, by bike and walk and transit in these communities is, is higher about 50 percent higher 16 percent compared to the statewide average of 10 percent um, and then the transit, transit stop density is higher we also know from our travel survey that uh, people who live at or below the poverty line walk about 40 percent more miles uh, compared to people who live above the poverty line, and that those households, those poverty households or households living in poverty, um, take transit and uh, uh, at about uh, a double the rate uh, or three times the rate. Uh, um, and so again, they're exposed more, they're out walking and using this system as, as pedestrians and transit users at a significantly higher rate. The second pathway that we're documenting is that this walking and transit activity is taking place in environments that are less hospitable for that type of activity. Um, we do have limitations in, in our data and being able to tell this story uh, as clearly as we'd like, but what we do know is that um, in these census tracts that we classified as high concentration of low-income people in BIPOC, um, the arterial vehicle volume is about 68% higher than the state average and much higher than those lowest census tracts, those lowest classifications. Um, and the density of high-speed roads is also a lot higher in these high poverty tracts. We weren't able to directly measure, you know, presence of sidewalks, crosswalks, you know, um, high visibility crossings, street lighting. Uh, we weren't able to measure those directly in Oregon because we don't have a statewide database of those things. We have a phase two, which we'll talk about at the end of this. Um, but we're going to try and get at some of that through some data development. But what we know from other research is that there are disparities in things like sidewalk completeness between high income areas and low income areas. That, that's similar for um, the completeness and availability of, of, side, of street crossings and uh, street lighting. And we have some figures here from, from past research that recounts that. So, we took a look at these injury disparities using some direct measurements from FARS. We took another approach where we classified census tracts based on the concentration of race and income and then calculated rates. But we also did a more rigorous statistical analysis looking at all the factors within census tracts that correlate, uh, correlate with pedestrian injury. And what we found, um, we're presenting here in some pretty simplified fashion, just showing whether or not the factor was associated with more pedestrian injury, which is a red arrow pointing up, or less, which is a green arrow pointing down, and just categorizing these by sociodemographics, traffic exposure, and built environment. What we found is a really strong, consistent predictor is, is income. Um, 
And what we found is that, you know, in, in statistical terms, for every $10,000 a uh, decrease in the median income of a census tract, you'd expect about a 12% increase in pedestrian injuries. And income was one of the strongest, excuse me, uh, one of the most consistent predictors across all the models and all the different specifications, all the different uh, years of data that we tried. Um, and similarly, uh, BIPOC, the percentage of the tract is BIPOC, and then we even disaggregated by certain BIPOC categories like Latinx and Black. Um, and Asian, um, and, and in a lot of the models, most of the models, those variables are, are positively associated with pedestrian injury. Other proxies for low income, like dis disabled population and English proficiency were also correlated with pedestrian injury. Um, and that's even after accounting for all of these measures of traffic exposure and built environment, um, which we have summarized here. It's true that our statistical models didn't benefit from perfect data. And so a lot of our variables, and especially in, in uh, sociodemographics, I think are accounting for other types of built environment uh, measures. And so, for instance, income likely being a factor for greater exposure um, through walking and, 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 and um, taking transit, although we did try to control for those as best we can. Um, and uh, specifically, you know, transit stop density and the workers commuting by transit. Um, but even with those control variables, we found that income and, and race were still positively associated. Another really interesting one was alcohol establishment density um, and how that was positively correlated with, with pedestrian injuries. So one of the other objectives we had in this research was to, to measure, try and measure how these disparities might be changing over time. And so this chart just shows that initial chart using the FARS data, those kind of basic direct measurements of uh, injuries per population. And just looking at two periods of time, looking at them categorized in each panel here by separate race categories um, all, and comparing that to the state average. And what we found is, you know, pedestrian injury burden, the burden on the population is, is growing for everybody. We're having that, and that's a factor of, you know, pedestrian injury is growing faster than population. But what we found is the BIPOC rates are growing uh, about by about uh, double the state average. And you can see that in the bottom right hand uh, panel. Um, and strikingly, uh, rates for, for, for Black Oregonians were growing really fast at about three times the state average. So what, we've, what our conclusion here, uh, based on these data, that disparities are growing um, um, and that the rate for BIPOC populations is growing faster than the state average. We also took a look at the, at, the, at the change over time using this index framework that we developed. And so the chart on the right I showed earlier, this is just looking at the census tract categorization and the, and the number of pedestrian injuries by population based on those uh, track, those track categorizations. And again, uh, if you look at just that Oregon average line, the dotted line, you see that that is increasing. That's again, a measure of, of just the, the burden on the population. So it's in, you know, injury, pedestrian injury rates are growing for everybody. Uh, but what we found is for census tracts classified as moderate and high, those rates of increase are greater um, than, uh, than the state average and also uh, they're growing faster than the lowest and low categories. So the, that's a summary of our findings. Um, I'm gonna talk now just about the, the data and methods uh, that we use to get after this. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, um, but I'm kind of looking at the students in the room um, who are you know, thinking about um, uh, you know, some of the work that they're doing in their coursework and maybe thinking about uh, thesis, you know, thesis and dissertation work. Um, so you know, one of the things we wanted to make sure we did as part of this work is, is look at every piece of available data that we could that would help tell the story and answer these questions. Um, and so we ended up pulling data from a lot of different places to inform a lot of different methods. We ended up using uh, three methods um, and data from multiple sources. So, you know, our crash data system, I talked about the FARS. Um, I didn't, I'm not going to talk about any today, but uh, the chapter seven of our, of our report is really interesting where we looked at uh, EMS data. So these are uh, data, crash data from our fire and, and, um, and ambulance data. Uh, one of the fun one of the interesting things about that data is it not only told us where the incident happened, but where the participant lived. And so we could do some analysis about like how far away from home were people actually being injured. There was a question from ODOT staff who helped uh, run this study. Um, do, when you look at census tract data and you relate pedestrian injuries, that census tract data is actually representing residential information to a certain extent, um, unless you're looking at workplace data. But um, 
but but can we really assume that people who were injured in a census tract live there? And so with the data we have from EMS, um, we could help to kind of flush out some of that story. We obviously use a lot of data from census on population, sociodemographics, and then in terms of built environment and traffic exposure, multiple sources fed um, fed that, uh, that that element. So we had a lot of data from ODOT. We used open street maps for things like intersection density. And then we had data from OLCC, the Oregon Liquor uh, Control Commission for where alcohol establishments were. And then we had the Oregon Household Travel Survey um, that we used to help understand uh, travel differences by race and income. Um, you know, no source of data is perfect, but you know, using multiple sources of data, multiple uh, methods, we hope to try to triangulate what was going on in terms of social equity outcomes uh, and pedestrian injuries. So we did use multiple methods. Uh, we went through the first two in a lot of detail, the FARS rates um, in that first uh, box, and then the Z-scoring, that this sort of index standardized scoring approach. You know, there's trade-offs to all of these. Um, uh, the FARS rates and the Z-scoring, they're, they're a lot simpler, they're easy to interpret, um, but you know, they're not as rigorous as like our statistical analysis. Um, I wanna point out to folks too, and we can put some links in the chat uh, and, uh, that we have uh, the, the first two methods and all the data that went into that up on a GitHub, so folks can pull those down. Um, there's some some useful utilities in there. You know, FARS data is really a bear to work with to try to get it off of NITS's website. So I have some uh, utility functions in there for uh, which we're all programmed in R to help you pull those data down and wrangle them um, and get them into a source that's useful for analysis. Um, and then uh, the statistical analysis stuff is going to come out uh, as soon as we kind of get th we get through some peer review and we get to make sure we have the final version that goes into peer review publication. Uh, we'll post those to GitHub as well. But hopefully some of these tools are useful for pe people. Um, so that's um, a, um, what I have to share about the research that we did and a little of the context in which it which it sits. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Nathan now and let him talk about how our work fits into the, the existing body of research and some other conceptual things. Great, thanks, Josh, for uh, taking us through the the uh, analysis and methods there. Um, I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about how does our research fit into the broader body of research and. Um, both within the context of pedestrian safety, but also looking, uh, stepping back a little bit further uh, and looking at transportation, uh, poverty and transport, the transportation experience overall and kind of how that plays into our, our lives and experiences. Um, so first in terms of, uh, you know, our, our findings from Oregon are largely consistent with what we found from other studies in our review, uh, including studies that took place in other regions and with a national scope. Um, prior to conducting this survey, we looked at 22 other uh, studies that uh, carried out ecological analyses, uh, which are essentially studies looking at the factors uh, from the surrounding environment that are associated with pedestrian crashes. Um, most of the studies uh, included a selection of the variables shown here. Um, in some cases, there was a little bit of discrepancy, but generally, and, and Josh, you can, sorry, I'm still on. Um, but in general, we found that uh, in the studies that we looked at found that more BIPOC residents, uh, areas with lower median incomes and areas with lower education levels, uh, more non-English speaking residents and higher unemployment were associated with more pedestrian crashes. Uh, those activity and exposure measures are likely tied into how often people are out walking and thus exposed to crash risk. Uh, and the roadway environment characteristics are, are tied to conditions that result in more and higher speed traffic. And uh, it makes sense that there would be a connection to pedestrian safety there. In terms of those race, income, education, and language variables, um, most of the studies of the 22 studies that we looked at included one or more of those, but in some cases uh, only carried one or two through to a final model because of correlation amongst uh, those variables. Um, but they did tend to, if they had significant findings, they were that you know, in, in line with uh, the what's shown here. So the kind of the increase with that higher proportion of BIPOC or lower income, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of population and employment density, we did see some differences in the literature based on some land use context. In general, population density was tied to, uh, so in increased population density was tied to higher crash, pedestrian crash risk, which makes sense because there's more people. Um, but there were some studies that looked a little bit closer and found that in fact, in uh, cities and urban areas, higher population density was actually tied to fewer fatalities, whereas increased density 
um, in suburban uh, areas was actually tied to higher crashes. So it, there may be some idea that um, higher density places in lower, in less built up areas uh, may be uh, a predictor of pedestrian crashes. Um, in terms of employment density, there was some, uh, in, again, in general, higher employment density was tied to higher pedestrian crashes, but there were some studies that looked a little bit more finely and, and found that uh, density of, in, of employment in certain areas like entertainment and food services, and as well as uh, kind of strip style development was tied to more pedestrian crashes. Um, so that's just a, a quick overview of the kind of the landscape of some of these uh, ecological studies. Um, and Josh, if you want to go to the next slide now. Um, so uh, both our study and the literature I covered are contributors are, are, are contributors to greater inequity in transportation. But I uh, and uh, I want to talk about this graphic, which shows kind of how uh, inequity in transportation. Uh, plays out into you know into uh, into inequity and accessibility, and there's a self-reinforcing nature to it. Um, as you can see here, um, the the various factors of transport disadvantage and social disadvantage um, have a resulting uh, you know challenge present uh, challenges to people in terms of what they can get to, and and that in turn plays into uh, kind of the experiences and opportunities that they have in life. So uh, you know, some studies have found that in terms of job access, uh, as, it sh as it shows there, people with ac access to a car uh, have access to more jobs than uh, people that rely on transit. They also, you know, there's also this important idea that um, you know, mobility is important for networks and acquaintances, mm -hmm. uh, other aspects of employment and seeking, uh, you know, finding work or finding promotions um, that are not specifically tied to um, actually having a job. Um, in terms of food access, studies have found that low-income neighborhoods have fewer stores offering healthy foods and that improved transportation access uh, is connected to shopping for and eating healthier foods. Uh, in terms of uh, healthcare, transportation barriers are connected to missed medical appointments or cancellations, uh, people not filling prescriptions, not getting regular medical care and unmet referrals. So that has, can play out in kind of the health uh, over time. Uh, and in terms of pollution, um, air quality, particularly from transportation emissions, is, has been shown to be worse in communities of color. And one recent study, uh, this was a TESM, noted that uh, not only are Black and Hispanic populations exposed to higher level of fine particulate matter pollution, um, but they're also less likely, to, they, those populations are less likely to cause the, the pollution. So they're driving less, but they're, but they're breathing in more of the, the emissions from that. Um, so we wanted to take this graphic, and Josh, you can go to the next slide now, and uh, take a look at how, uh, and, and focus in on kind of the transportation safety side of it. Um, and how that sits alongside inaccessibility as uh, an output of this broader system. Um, Josh covered a lot of these items in the earlier part of the study, in, 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 sorry, in the earlier part of the presentation, but uh, just looking at a few of those inputs, you know, car ownership, uh, National Household Transportation Survey data shows that nationally 26% of households earning under 25,000 uh, don't own a car compared to only two to 3% of households earning 50,000 or more. So that's a huge difference. Um, as Josh mentioned earlier, uh, walking and transit rates are much higher for lower income and BIPOC Oregonians, meaning that they have higher exposure to traffic. Um, there's also been research that shows that they tend to, or they're more likely to have to make, that tri make those trips uh, outside of standard uh, working hours. And so they may be traveling in low light conditions, for example, which would put them at higher risk of a pedestrian crash. Um, in terms of the built environment, uh, that's tied to housing location as well. And as Josh noted earlier, um, higher poverty and BIPOC populations are subject to higher arterial vehicle volume and, and higher speeds. Um, and other factors could be at play there as well, including uh, you know, access to safe pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and then uh, racial bias you know, plays in here as well. You know, it, it's experienced in various aspects of the transportation system, um, from, uh, from traffic stops to uh, you know, uh, those populations being more likely to be arrested for under comparable circumstances. 
Um, more germanely to traffic safety, there's evidence that drivers are less likely to yield to black pedestrians, uh, which would seemingly put them in danger of being struck by a passing vehicle, but could also influence their decision making about what sorts of gaps were safe to cross uh, in. Um, and so in the end, I think it's clear that there are some of the factors that result in kind of transport, transport poverty and inaccessibility are also at play in terms of uh, uh, putting lower income and BIPOC Oregonians at greater uh, risk of pedestrian uh, crashes as well. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so that kind of leaves us with, what, so what are the recommendations to follow out of this? Um, the phase two of this project will look at, uh, we'll be looking at roadway safety on a network level and, and including incorporating walk activity or proxies for walk activity. Um, there's also clearly a need for greater roadway, for more roadway data collection, including around pedestrian infrastructure, um, such as sidewalk and crossing information. Um, there's not currently a, a statewide database on that. And while some localities do collect that information, I think it's incomplete or inconsistent um, because it's not a, a, you know, a standard across the state. Um, in terms of travel activity data, we need more pedestrian counts as well as improvements to travel activity surveys to ensure that we're capturing both non-motorized trips and uh, capturing all Oregonians. Um, and then in terms of crash data elements, um, uh, the Oregon Health Authority, Authority collects data on race, ethnicity, language, and disability, and uh, bringing that sort of information into crash data. Um, as well as information on vehicle details like weight, class, and horsepower, and other design features uh, would help us better understand what are the factors that are affecting transportation, pedestrian safety. Um, and I, it's worth noting that uh, personal vehicle weight has increased by 26% between in the last 30 years. And so there's a reasonable uh, assumption that that's playing into pedestrian safety, um, but we need better data to really understand that story. Um, so next slide. Um, and finally, uh, you know, as a last note before we open it up for questions, uh, here's, uh, there are links here to the phase one technical report uh, shown on the screen, and we can drop that into the chat as well. Um, while we drew from the report for this presentation, as Josh mentioned earlier, there's a lot more in the report than we could cover today, um, including an extensive literature review covering a lot of the stuff that I've just talked about. So go on there and check it out. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for questions. All right, excellent presentation, Josh and Nathan, um, really in-depth uh, analysis. And I was looking forward to your presentation. Um, and now I need to go into the report because it's got lots of good stuff. So how about the question, get you started on um, how did you determine that people in poverty walk 40% more than people not in poverty? What, what data did you use for that? Uh, yeah, so uh, in 2009 to 2011, uh, ODOT did, uh, with its local partners at the MPOs uh, conducted a travel survey of 18,000 households across Oregon. That's a one day travel survey. Uh, where people are asked to fill out all the travel activity they did in, in a single day. And um, along with the information about their travel, we collect all the information about their household characteristics, so income, poverty status, uh, race, vehicle ownership, those things. Um, and so that summary stat is uh, uh, pulled out of those data. All right, thank you. Um, so um, we have a question about whether there's any data on um, the severity of the injury itself by race and ethnicity or disability status that you've seen. What was the last part of that or the what status? Disability, disability status. status. Um, because the FARS data is only fatal accidents, fatal injuries. Um, we don't have the ability to look at severity because it's all one severity. Um, and I do not believe FARS collects information on disability. I actually didn't look at that. Um, and uh, in terms of ODOT's data, we don't collect race, we don't collect income. And so, um, you know, and, and I don't think we have anything in there on disability either. 
And I, I guess I'd add, you know, that's one of the reasons why we did want to take this ecological approach is that it allows us to take, you know, we may not know the race uh, or disability status of people involved in crashes, but um, we can look at these other factors to try to understand how they're being affected by those. But yeah, it does leave the severity as a, uh, a challenge there. Okay, um, sorry, where'd that question go? There it is. Um, on slide 16, uh, what is what do you think the reason that the 45 mile an hour roadway is associated with decreasing pedestrian crash rates? Yeah, uh, this is something that everyone asks about. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a uh, good thing to point out and a good question. So, uh, I think it's two, th two things. One is that, you know, the nature of the analysis at the, at the track level makes summarizing network details difficult and sort of wonky, janky. Um, we're trying to interpret these data uh, or trying to inter interpret this finding. One, and, and one of the things we thought was that maybe it's that we're actually maybe picking up somewhat on the lack of pedestrian activity with this measure under the assumption that 45 mile an hour roadways are typically in the sort of ex-urban areas um, where maybe people are walking less and that we account for that speed effect mostly with the 35 mile an hour variable. Um, but we, I, I re-estimated I re models different ways, accounting for different factors. And for some reason, the 45 mile an hour kept being, uh, if we combined it with the 35 mile an hour, kept producing this result. So we wanted to be honest about those results and present them here. Uh, but I think it's just that we might be measuring something uh, else with this measure. Um, although recently I found that some of the network data that ODOT manages might not actually be tracking factors like this well over time. And so it could be too that there's some data quality issues with, especially with ODOT reducing a lot of um, speed limits um, in the last few years, um, especially during the period of these data. So maybe not a satisfying answer, but um, yeah, just and just for clarification, is it is it miles of roadway in the in the census tract? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's a density of roadways marked forty five mile an hour. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have question or questions from the audience, kind of combining two different questions. Um, what are some safety infrastructure um, improvements that have been made in Oregon specifically to reduce these types of crashes? They're looking for examples or whether there are any takeaways for what public agencies should be doing to um, you know, deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, we've been working with a lot of the terrific researchers at Portland State to uncover what what the what treatments are effective? Um, Chris, uh, uh, Professor Monser has finished some work recently with uh, Sarisha Katuri uh, looking at uh, mid-block crossing treatments, and so uh, rapid flashing beacons and their crash effectiveness we know can impact crash. Uh, we know can reduce crash injury for pedestrians. We know that speed limits and roadway configurations, more commonly known as road diets, can help. Um, you know, street lighting is a policy that the city of Portland has been uh, moving forward with installing street lighting in a lot of places. We know that that can have an impact. Um, and there are others, uh, but those are sort of a short list. Um, I, I might add to that, um, you know, we know a lot of the, th we have a pretty good idea about many things that can help, right? And so one of the ideas of this project is to help understand where those interventions can be most effective or where they're not currently um, uh, you know, in place. Um, or, and that's one of the things that we stated as a data need is you know, better pedestrian infrastructure data to know where, where more needs to be done. Um, but this project will hopefully help inform uh, where those things get done and, and help prioritize investments. The, uh, the alcohol establishment metric, was that alcohol served, sold, or both? It was both. Um, the models seemed to, to be more stable when we included both, although um, I found that the off-site consumption, so a store where you would go and buy it and go home potentially, 
or maybe on the way home, um, those were uh, a more consistent predictor, but we ended up grouping them into both. Um, and so some interesting, uh, interesting theories there as to, you know, whether this relates to the pedestrian activity or the driver activity in and around uh, those alcohol establishments um, would require some more, more analysis. But yeah, it's both on and offsite consumption. So I have a question of my own about the, um, about the crash injury data that you displayed with um, the various different modes all the way from motorcycle, which appears to be the most um, highest rates of, um, I think, injury or death, I can't remember. Um, so I was wondering in that kind of data, does it, um, is, is there anything that tells you whether these are more like single vehicle or single, um, you know, yeah, single vehicle or motorcycle injuries versus, you know, how many parties are involved and, you know, whether it's one accident involving mm -hmm. many um, parties or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there is, yeah, we could, we could un untangle that if we wanted. Yeah. I mean, so what we're looking at is injuries. And so if there's one crash uh, with four vehicles for motor vehicle um, and everyone gets injured, that's four injuries. Um, so if that clarifies um, motorcycle, I don't know enough about motorcycle safety. Um, I think a lot of them are single vehicle, like motorcycles running off the road um, type injuries. that I'd have to look in detail. <clears throat> but yeah, no matter what your teenage son or daughter wants, don't buy him a motorcycle. Um, has there been any public outreach, especially to people of color, educating them about the, this issue of pedestrian safety? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, we had a person from our education and kind of marketing folk, uh, a group uh, within our traffic safety office is on, on this research. And we talked about how to use, especially the, the spatial fabric of where high injury uh, uh, census tracts are to think about um, doing marketing and, and education in those, um, in, those, in those communities. And so that, that idea has been, been talked about. Uh, but I can't say I sort of I'm, I'm we do the research we have we hand it off we try to create products that the agency then can use and so um, kind of have to punt on that and say um, um, we help to inform ongoing agency operations but I can't say for sure um, what types of programs might be attributed by. Um, so we have an audience member asking, um, they're coming from Hillsborough, they're curious about how truly urban areas see lower crashes, but increasing density in less urban areas increases them. And they assume it's because the number of pedestrians increases in these um, more dense, less urban areas, but the environment isn't crowded enough to change driver behavior. Is there any data on where the tipping point might be where increasing density starts to decrease crashes? Hmm. I don't know. So I don't, Josh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, I don't know that we can speak to that from our findings. I, if, there, if you have any thoughts on that, otherwise I can speak to the literature a little bit. No, um, um, I think from our work, so go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, what I would say is, um, you know, the, the higher density areas in uh, non, non-urban counties, non-urban areas, uh, often is of a more strip style development. And it's, um, you know, so there, there may be areas with much higher number of driveways, much higher number, you know, more, uh, more complexity and more, more vehicles. Um, whereas when you get into urban areas, um, you know, I think that there's, a, and this is where having better pedestrian infrastructure would help as well, and better data on pedestrian infrastructure, but just knowing the, you know, the number of, of crossings, crosswalks, and, 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 pull, and you know, taking into account speed and all these things, you know, I think that um, urban areas, are, the pedestrians are more expected. Um, so we don't know the, we don't have the exact data on kind of what that threshold is. Um, but you can think about the, the style of density in uh, outside of urban areas. And it, you know, it has some of these factors that uh, we did see uh, associated with um, 
with more pedestrian crashes. So, you know, higher volumes, higher speeds, um, um, and then, you know, more in and out and, you know, other, other factors, so. All right, I'm gonna use my moderator's privilege and ask a question not in the Q&A. Um, on, on your last slide, thinking about the size of vehicles, have you, have you had any initial thoughts about how you might, how you might approach that? Yes, so we have another project that's going on now to do some data linkage, uh, taking our crash data and linking it back with our DMV vehicle records. Um, all that data is there, all those data elements about size, horsepower are all there. We just need to link them back into our vehicle crash file. So we're doing that data development now. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll work out that, you know, some of the methods to, to test uh, the hypothesis that weight um, and vehicle design is playing into injury severity. Um, and we'll, we'll have that in our ODOT data. So we have all those injury severities so we can, we can test this more rigorously. Um, so that's kind of what that looks like. Okay. Um, and we hope that uh, we will integrate these data on an ongoing basis so that our standard crash file will have those vehicle details. Um, on an ongoing basis so we can continue to monitor this. Yeah, I, I had a, I worked with a OHSU public epidemiologist student that looked at the FARS data because uh, it has the VIN records um, and that, you know, it, it and then looked at weights and, and it was hard to get anything conclusive because of the change, the, lo the longevity of the vehicle, like without an exposure measure of how, mm -hmm. how long the, you know how many of the large F-250s are out. It it was really mm -hmm. noisy. Um, so I was just uh, I was just wondering if you if you'd come across anything extra about that. Well, if that works, if that works ongoing. We have the vehicle population data too, um, all been decoded. So um, we can talk. No, she she graduated. <laughs> so um, someone is wondering: Is there any relation? between job the job density factor and mixed land use in your in the Oregon data and does intersection density is that also correlated with vehicle speed in the research hmm. um, what was the first part of that uh, job density and job. Um, mixed land use yeah um, we didn't look at that specifically we did uh, produced some models that had uh, measures of employment density and specifically by low income, low wage workers. And that was also a factor. Um, it was collinear with some other things that we wanted to keep in the models. And so I think we kept them in some of what we presented in models, uh, summary re re results in, in, the, uh, in the report. Um, and so it's sort of interesting, like we're thinking about this in terms of a residential context, but I think it's important for us to consider also where people work um, in, the, in the built environment and uh, travel activity uh, in those areas too. Um, and then in terms of intersection density correlated with speeds, I do think that, the, you know, this is the problem with not having perfect data or better data on the built environment is I think intersection density is accounting for a lot of built environmental factors that we just don't have data on. Um, things like downtown areas that have a lot of stuff that, you know, and also activity, right? And things like people being more uh, likely to, you know, drivers being more likely to expect pedestrians and that sort of thing. So I think intersection density is a measure of a lot of things, is a proxy for a lot of things. Um, and so it's difficult to untangle uh, exactly what it is. I wonder if you have any thoughts on how you might expand this, the, the, the analysis to include people with disabilities. Well, um, you know, doing some analysis, maybe at this big scale, like we've done, or at the network level, where we're looking at inter specific intersections and segments, and we have some information maybe about ADA curb ramps and how that impacts things. I mean, be great if we had measures of exposure like you know how many people who are disabled you know are using the system um 
And also without good data on the disabled status of the crash injury participant, I think it makes it hard. Um, you know, there's always more like specific ways of going about doing research and actually, you know, getting a body of people to, to survey and ask, you know, asking them, are they disabled or not? And then, you know, asking them about perceptions of safety, that, that sort of thing. But um, I'd have to think about that more to come up maybe with a more, uh, a better answer for an experimental. I was fumbling with my mute button. Um, so uh, this is kind of um, just a question about whether you anticipate that automated vehicles might reduce pedestrian injury or fatal crashes. Has there been any studies conducted to determine the safety of pedestrians from um, the introduction of automated vehicles? Mm -hmm. You know, the automated vehicle future is a cloud of potential possibilities, depending on what, what the future looks like. Um, you know, we, do we all own an automated vehicle versus do we, you know, just call one up on our uh, in chip implant uh, or do we, uh, and so, you know, um, I think there's some exciting technology for vehicles now with pedestrian detection systems um, that is not like a full automated vehicle system, but something that, that utilizes technology to help. Um, so, you know, it could go both ways in my, in my mind. Um, could, be, could be a boon or it could be a bust. Okay, I think, I think we've gotten to almost all all of the questions in, in some way or another, not each one exactly, but kind of wrap up here with this last question and paraphrasing a little bit in terms of um, what, what do you, so tree planting and tree cover and urban heat islands sort of associated with, um, you know, large roadways that also sort of may be connected to, um, the infrastructure variables that you saw. So either from the literature or, or from any of the data sources that you looked at, was that something about sort of tree cover or um, sort of tree cover or, or quality of the, of the walking experience? Was that something that you were able to, to get? So I can speak uh, to, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in and say there in the literature, yeah, there is, there, there are at least one or two studies looking at tree cover in, uh, you know, and by by income and and um, I think by by race and finding that those those higher in higher proportions of low income and and more BIPOC residents is you know those areas often have less tree cover and um, but uh, it's not something that we looked at. But Josh, I don't know if you, you can go ahead and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's what I would say is that relationship between income and tree cover is sort of implicit in some of this, but we didn't look at it, uh, you know, specifically. Okay, um, well, for, for Josh and Nathan, that if you, there is a lot of helpful comments, uh, as well as questions in the Q&A session, and we'll be forwarding those to you so you can, you can take a look at them. But uh, thank you for the presentation uh, today. And if you're a student uh, in the class, the, the post-seminar hangout Zoom link, um, pr Professor Lou and I won't be able to attend, but you should still be able to join in and chat with your fellow students if, you, if you're able to do that. It's on the D2L course shell and you can log in and, and chat. So um, thank you for attending the Friday Transportation Seminar. You should get, uh, all attendees should get a short survey at the after the seminar closes, uh, please take that. We use that feedback um, for um, improving the seminar. So with that, uh, we will see you next week. Thank you.